Hello and welcome to lecture 5 of the forces unit in Phys 1104. And in this lecture we're going to look at forces that vary because they depend on position, time, or velocity. Many forces are constant. For example, the gravitational force is constant. Often frictional forces are, and many other forces are or can be constant, such as thrust by rockets and jets. Constant forces are easy to deal with because they cause constant accelerations, and in Unit 3 of the course we learned good ways to find the subsequent motion of an object if we know that it has a constant acceleration. Many, or in fact most, forces are non-constant, however. We've seen that spring forces depend on spring length. We know that the accelerations during collisions are very time-dependent, and so they must be caused by very time-dependent forces. Air drag depends on speed. Electric forces depend on the relative positions of charges. And magnetic forces are very complicated, depending on both position and velocity. But we'll see all of that in Phys 1204. The point is that predicting motions of objects when the forces on them are non-constant requires more sophisticated methods. We saw some of that in Unit 3, where we learned to integrate acceleration versus time functions, but as you may appreciate, that's rather laborious, and it would be nice to have some easier ways. So how does the spring deformation depend on the force exerted by the spring? Well, now that we know how to calculate gravitational forces from the previous lecture, we can use that to indirectly measure spring forces. If we hang something like a brick off of the end, then we know in equilibrium the upward force exerted by the spring is equal in magnitude to the downward gravitational force, and we know how to calculate that gravitational force, and so that's just given us an indirect measurement of the force that the spring is exerting on the brick, which is again equal in magnitude magnitude to the force that the brick is exerting on the spring. And so now we can do an experiment to find the function connecting the spring deformation to the force exerted. I'm going to set an x-axis along the spring, and that's just so that the x-component of our force and the x-component of the displacement of the end of the spring have signs associated with them that we can use to talk about direction. So we hang some mass off of the spring and see how much it stretches, and hang some more mass off of the spring and see how much more it stretches, and now we plot the x component of its displacement versus the x component of the force exerted on it, and we see that it's a lovely straight line. That's great! Linear functions are really easy to deal with. Now remember that the amount of deformation for a given force depends on how stiff the spring is, so we should probably repeat the experiment with a stiffer spring, and we again get a linear relationship, but we see a smaller amount of, de of deformation for any given force. But I've been plotting that with the forces on the horizontal axis. That's because the forces were under my direct control, and so it made sense to think of them as the independent variable. But we usually plot these with the force on the vertical axis for reasons that you'll see. But part of this just shows you that what we choose as our independent and dependent variables is often sort of arbitrary. So plotting it up that way, it looks like this, with the stiffer spring having a steeper slope on the force versus displacement graph. And now we calculate the slopes, and they come out like this. Now we can write the force as a function of the amount of deformation, and because the data shows us this is a linear relationship, that's a very easy function to write down. The force is just some constant times the displacement of the end. And that constant is just the slope of our fx versus x graph. And we'll call that the stiffness of the spring. You'll often see it called the spring constant, but I prefer to call it the stiffness because that's more descriptive of what it means. And so if you look, we see that our stiffer spring has come out with a higher stiffness than our soft spring. That makes sense, and that's part of why we put the force on the vertical axis. Now, the force that the spring exerts on the mass is just the negative of the force that the mass is exerting on the spring. Remember, that means that these forces are the same magnitude and point in opposite directions. And so, in particular, its x component is going to be a negative k times the x component of the displacement. That 
negative sign is simply saying that this, the force exerted by the spring points in the opposite direction to the displacement. And either of these forms of the equation are what we call Hooke's Law. So here's our woman in the elevator from a few lectures ago, but now there's a spring hanging from the ceiling with a brick on it. The elevator is going up and it's speeding up at 1.5 meters per second squared. The spring has a stiffness of 200 newtons per meter and is 10 centimeters long when it's relaxed. And we observe that at the moment it's 25 centimeters long. We don't know the inertia of the brick, let's find it. So. The brick is the thing to pay attention to. Let's draw its free body diagram. And first of all, it's in contact with the spring, and that's it. So the only contact force on it is a contact force spring on brick. And then of course, as always, there's the earth exerting a gravitational force. and the brick is accelerating up. And remember, from the woman's perspective, the brick is just sitting stationary, but that's a non-inertial reference frame, and so we don't want to work from that perspective. So for an observer outside the elevator, that brick would be accelerating up with the elevator. So now let us define our axes. I'm going to put my x or my y axis up, all our forces are aligned with the y-axis, so now I'm going to write my sum, my vector sum of forces is just going to be a sum of y components of forces. So my vector sum, my sum of y components, is just going to be that I have an f due to the spring, minus, so the y component of the gravitational force due to the earth is just minus the magnitude of that force since it's pointing down and that will all equal my ma which is the y component of a but that's just equal to the magnitude of a since a is up and we now know We've got our direction, right? Remember that a spring force, FSB contact, well, there's this question of whether there's a negative here. But look, we've already taken care of the direction. We know it's up, and so the Y component of this force is positive. And so uh, I'm going to call its length L minus its relaxed length L0. And that's how, I, how I'm going to write it. And I don't need any negative because I've already dealt with its direction. And the negative is just there to get it pointing the right way. Minus this, which we know is mg. And there we go. And so now we solve for m. I have solved it for m and put in the numbers, being careful to use meters for the spring lengths, and I've got an answer of 2.6 kilograms, which I think is in kilograms, but let me check the units. I've got newtons per meter times meters all over meters per second squared. So these meters take out these meters, and a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and so I've got that over meter per second squared, and the meters per second squareds take each other out, and I have kilograms as I should. Remember that with the choice of axes I made, positive values of the displacement of the end of the spring corresponded to stretches. Negative values would correspond to compression, and the springs I was using were too floppy to put them in compression, but I could use other springs and see that the linear relationship between the force on the spring and the displacement of its end continues into compression. However, Hooke's law is not universal. You can push things too far and things deviate from the 
straight line that is what Hooke's law says. For example, if you compress too much, eventually the coils start getting in each other's way, and the spring does what's called bottoming out, and now a very large increase in the force leads to a very small change in the displacement of the end. At the other end of things, if you stretch it if you stretch it too much, then it starts irreversibly deforming, and as it does so, the f versus x graph becomes nonlinear. Eventually, the spring breaks. Hooke's law says nothing about any of this. It only applies in this linear portion that we call the elastic range. Forces exerted by springs are position-dependent, and in the next unit we're going to see a special way of dealing with position-dependent forces, but now let's turn our attention towards time-dependent forces. And for this we're going to have to pull out something that we haven't seen since I just mentioned it way back in Unit 4, when I told you that the change in momentum for a non-isolated system is something that we call the impulse. Well, we can finally do something with that now, because we know that the rate of change of momentum is the vector sum of forces, and so we ought to be able to relate that to impulse. So, although we're looking for a way to deal with time-dependent forces, let's start with some constant forces acting on some object over a time interval from some ti to tf. And because the forces are constant, the acceleration is constant, and we don't need a derivative. We can just say that the acceleration is a delta v over delta t. And let's multiply both sides by the inertia, and we get this, which brings our delta p into the equation, and we can solve for that change of momentum. But look at that ma hanging out there. We know what an ma is. That's the vector sum of forces. So we can just plug that in, and we get this and our delta p is the same as our impulse, and so we've managed to relate impulse to the vector sum of forces. This is the impulse equation for constant forces, and we'll generalize it to non-constant forces in a moment, but let's just stop and interpret it for a moment. It's vectorial, so let's think about the x component. So here is a sum of x components of forces versus time for this constant set of forces. And note that there's delta t, and there is the sum of the x component of forces. And when you multiply those two together, that's going to give you the x component of the impulse. But look, it's just the area under the graph. And in what I hope will be a very familiar looking argument, I'm going to show that this will apply not just in cases of constant force, that we'll always be able to find impulse from the area under a force versus time graph. So now I just make the same argument that I did in Unit 3 when I was showing you how to get a change in velocity from a time-varying acceleration. We just divide up the area under the x component of force graph versus time into a bunch of rectangles of some arbitrary width delta t. And now we let that delta t go to zero, so we're thinking of making narrower and narrower rectangles, more and more of them, and they become a better and better approximation to the actual area under that graph. And so we get our x component of the impulse as an integral of the x component of the vector sum of forces with respect to time. Or we can just define the vector then as the integral of the vector sum of forces itself with respect to time. Here's a ball hitting the floor, and we know its velocity before it hits the floor, but not after. But perhaps we have a force plate or something, and it's recorded this force versus time data. So, I have drawn the free body diagram for the ball during its contact with the force plate. All there is is a force up due to the force plate and the downward gravitational force, and the ball must be accelerating upward during the bounce off the force plate. And I'll just note that the gravitational force on it is about one newton. When you have a force versus time graph, that's a hint that impulse is going to be useful. So I've written that my y component of impulse is just this integral of the sum of the y components of the forces, and I've written my y components of the forces. But notice that gravitational force is tiny, so I'm just going to neglect it.
So that reduces the impulse to just an integral of the force due to the force plate with respect to time. Now I know you don't know how to do an integral, but it's just this area under this curve, and you don't need to know any calculus to know how to take the area under a triangle. From that, the rest of the solution proceeds easily because we know this is related to the change in momentum, which we can express in terms of the velocities and solve for what we're looking for.